Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. You're with us live here uh, on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We are coming to you today live from the East West Center at the University of Hawaii uh, from the Eco Days Conference, uh, Eco Days Symposium, I guess, technically. And uh, we're going to be interviewing several people uh, who are participating in Eco Days. Eco Days stands for Ecological Dissertations in Aquatic Sciences, if I recall correctly. Yep. We have with us uh, Sarah uh, Hu and Bryce Grinner, Grinner if I yep. get that correctly, great. Uh, Bryce is from City College of New York, and Sarah has just switched over from USC now to the Woods Hole Institute, Oceanographic Institute, right? Mm -hmm. Moving across the country. Excellent. Um, so tell us maybe a little bit just to start about what Eco Days is all about as, as a symposium. Uh, yeah, sure. So wh what's brought us all here to Honolulu to Eco Days is we're all our early career scientists in the aquatic in the aquatic sciences, mm -hmm. and we're all coming together as younger in our fields and trying to form new collaborations. And so we're. Uh, having really unique discussions that are interdisciplinary. Ah, that's so so important these days to get the the cross fertilization from different fields and get people out of their little sort of silos, right? Yes. So, Bryce, have you have you run into interesting people here and started some collaborations? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I th I think the biggest thing that I found uh, helpful is that sometimes when you're doing your research, you realize that there's areas that are lacking that you don't have expertise in, but you don't know quite how to connect with those people. And so, this has been a fantastic meeting for meeting those people and forming relationships that will carry on to future research efforts. Yeah, I noticed when I got a little blurb about, about it, they had an in search of everyone talked about what, they were, what they're looking for and sort of complementary expertise, right, people to fill in those areas where you may not quite be so strong, but also there was another section of what you're sharing too, which was great, because yes. different people have different strengths, some people really are big on the quantitative and other people want some help in that line, right? right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Sarah, you're, you're talking your title, at least it was, and I get a lot of titles of the projects have already changed in, in the course of several days, but it was on, on genetic characterization of microbial eukaryotic diversity and metabolic potential. So can you sort of tell us in a sentence or two what that's really about in, in non-technical non terms? Sure, sure. So I essentially study microbes that live in the ocean. Okay. Uh, and my specialty is single-celled microbial eukaryotes. So there's okay. uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Okay. Uh, and so I study the diversity of these microorganisms in our ocean systems, uh, and I'm striving to understand why they're in certain locations, uh, their diversity in a community, and their overall ecological impact in that system. Okay, great. Just just to clarify for our audience, prokaryotes and eukaryotes are two types of sort of fundamental two types division. Of fundamental u microbiota microorganisms. Right. Yeah. Prokaryotes are rather primitive bacteria. in some sense. Uh, not necessarily, oh, but right. yeah, but bacteria right. and where well, eukaryotes right. are. Yes. Eukaryotes are all yeah. of us. All of us as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Including our old microbes. Yes. A lot of our microbes. Yes. Of okay. Cool. And, and Bryce. Uh, you're, you are uh, characterizing CDOM spectral variability from sea to space, and CDOM, you were telling me earlier, stands for colored dissolved organic material? Yep. All right. Okay, I got that right. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what, what is this stuff, and why, why is it interesting? Uh, so I guess when I say spectral variability, you can think of uh, anything from a coffee to a tea. And oh. so um, when you when you put your tea bag into your hot water, uh, it goes from clear water to having some kind of color, and so the color is going to depend on the type of material. And so if you have like a white tea, it'll be clear. If you have a black tea, it's going to be darker brown. And so that's indicative of the type of material that's present. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I do is I use that color signature to track how carbon cycles across different uh, aquatic systems. Oh, okay. So even without knowing where, where the color is coming from, what particular organism the color is coming from, you can still make use of it just, just simply by its color. Yeah, and so the, I guess the, the spectral variability part comes in that um, each plant can have a particular signature. Mm -hmm. And so you can use that in some ways to track where the material came from and how it's being processed by, say, Sarah's microbes that she's studying. Oh, okay, cool, cool. So... Um, then, Sarah, getting back to your, uh, your work here, so these, uh, these microbes, these eukaryotes, uh, that live in the ocean, 
this, this, this is sort of a recent thing, right? They really discovered there's sort of this tremendous diversity of small things yes. that live in the ocean. And people really, until a few years ago, didn't have much clue about, right? We sort of thought of the ocean as being water, right? Mm -hmm. And now we realize it's sort of a teeming jungle, as it were. Yes. So, so there are rich uh, ecosystems going on in, with, with viruses, with bacteria, and with prokaryotes, and, and your eukaryotes. Yes. Which are probably sort of at the top of one level of a food chain, then, right, or a food web. Yeah, in some way. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but but then, so what, what other so what roles do they play? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, microbial eukaryotes play uh, various roles mm -hmm. in rain food webs. Uh, it's great because they they uh, they're pri they're primary producers and consumers, mm -hmm. meaning they mediate photosynthesis. Uh, so with uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide, they're able to uh, create, the, a product of that is oxygen, mm -hmm. and that oxygen becomes a really important part of our atmosphere, mm -hmm. and we need that to breathe, so that's super important. And then another product is that they uh, are producing this organic and usable carbon for all higher organisms in the ocean. So that's kind of the starting the base of marine food webs, the base of marine, the, the marine food chain. And so that's going to be consumed by other microbes, potentially even more microbes, and then uh, that'll be consumed by plankton, zooplankton, and then higher organisms, fishes, top predators, tuna, sharks, and as humans. Okay. So they, they play, they're playing a, a real vital role here in, in, yes. in this. Indeed, I've heard it said that, that something like one out of every two breaths of air we take are essentially due to the algae in the, in the exactly. ocean, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's, uh, that's important stuff. You see, this is kind of stuff that pe people, I think, do not often understand about science. And it seems sort of like you're studying an obscure topic in a way, right? And yet it turns out it's the very air we breathe and, and the, the oxygen that keeps us alive. Yeah, even though they're really small, right. they're a big deal. Yeah, because there's a lot of them. Yeah, people don't, don't understand that so much. So, um, and again, so, this, so your work actually does tie together in, in interesting ways, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, do you look, look at the, when you're looking at, the, at this color signature, uh, you said each organism has more or less a unique uh, set of organic dissolved materials that it puts out. Uh, is that because of different uh, pigments that, that, that that they contain in different different uh, constituents of those cells. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So if, when you think of algae, mm -hmm. um, not all of the pigments that they have, but some of them will dissolve into water. Okay. And so you can see that pigment signature in your dissolved organic matter pool. Okay. Um, but there's other. Um, I, I always liken it to if, if you're ever in like a temperate area and you go look at some of the lakes and streams. Sometimes there's a, a kind of black. Uh, color to the water. In mm -hmm. fact, some of the marshes that you see around the country have, you know, like black water <clears throat> in the in the title of the of the name of the area. And so that is the uh, essentially the material that's being produced by these systems. And it can vary based on uh, the general structure of the material and also where it comes from. And so that's where uh, serves where it comes in is that those uh, microbes are both utilizing that material, so changing its properties and changing its color, uh -huh. and then also producing their own color signature. Ah, so this, this is a real, I, I see that it's, it's not just an indicator of what form it comes, sort of comes out as, but, but how it changes over time, and it's, it's also telling you about the activity that's going on there. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's, that's it's a very dynamic thing. So, so how do you, what kind of instruments do you use to... So if you want detailed information, you would need to grab the water and bring it into the lab mm -hmm. and use a pretty uh, high-end instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but for broader spatial scales and temporal scales, it scales up to a satellite. Um, so with that, there's more error, and you can't tell quite as much about the material, but it does give you a view of essentially broad-scale processes that are happening that you can't get from going out in a ship or even from, say, like buoy measurements in the middle of the ocean. And so there's a a synergy between these different observing platforms and the information you can get from them. Excellent, excellent. And so do you use similar kinds of instrumentation in your work? So. Uh, yeah, some of those mm -hmm. pigments and being, can be read from satellite images and that gives us a lot of information for what's going on on a global scale. Okay. Uh, but rather than taking things in the lab, I'm off, I'm, well I do take things in the lab eventually, mm -hmm. but uh, I typically go out in a ship to collect seawater and do a lot of shipboard measurements to uh, filter that and collect that material and do concurrent measurements so get an understanding of what their surrounding it, the microbial surrounding is, 
and then uh, we take that material into the lab later. So. All right. Again, this this is sort of interesting that uh, we've gone off in this direction in the current issues around on the East Coast, particularly around Florida, having they've had very very bad red tides this year, which is, of course is it's these it's the pigments in certain microbes, right, that, that cause this sort of reddish tint to the water. And I gather it's not it's gone beyond the West Coast where it often occurs, and is now up on the East Coast and hitting some of Miami's beaches. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Any, any speculation as to, to what's causing that? Humans, probably. <laughs> That's the, the broadest way to put it. Uh, but, but more specifically, I mean, is, it, is this due to, I mean, is it related to pollution? To yeah, typically nutrient runoff. Uh -huh. um, so that's generally the setup for it. But a lot of these issues, especially the harmful algal blooms, like the red ties that you talk about, are exacerbated by climate change. So a warming system... Um, changes in sort of the basics of how it functions um, will ripple up into these, uh, you know, bloom events. And I think Sarah could probably speak to that a lot because what, you know, you do is looking at that really small scale change, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's going to be a, a mix of variables that come into play for what causes the bloom. And we're still trying to understand that in certain systems. Uh, I'm not as familiar with what's going off. I'm, I'm familiar with what's going off the coast of Florida, but I haven't been personally studying that mm -hmm. right now. But there's it's typically a mix of uh, temperature, nutrients, wind at a given time, and what's been uh, the uh, temperature in the last month in, in an area can also uh, impact lead up to potential bloom environment. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is very very neat. I mean, this is a wonderful example. Again, here here's another way where seemingly sort of an odd almost abstract science is tying in in a very real way to something that really impacts the lives of people. For instance, in Miami, Miami's losing millions of dollars in tourism, presumably, since no one can be out on their beaches and enjoying the water there, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a great example of how, how this, the kinds of science that you're practicing uh, really influences the lives and impacts the lives of, of people elsewhere. So that, that's, yes, that's wonderful, because as I said, I think that's a, a there's a broad misunderstanding of science, and science really doesn't have anything to do with our lives. And here we're, we're finding in several different ways how, how it really does. Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, Ethan, do you mind, actually, if I touch on something we talked about earlier? Is, go um, for it. So when I talked about the different scales, so like a satellite could give you a general sense of the scope of where that bloom is, but mm -hmm. you need people like Sarah to really dig into the cellular-level processes to understand why that's happening. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's, I think, what EcoDays is all about, is bringing together people who have different, you know, expertise and can understand the question better by bringing in all those tools together. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the different sort of mindsets and perspectives and as you say, expertise from the different fields can help reinforce, buttress, uh, make a stronger case for why why the red tide is where it is, when it is, right? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. And it's, it's great that this is... This is like the thirteenth Eco Day Symposium or something. Yeah, I think so yeah, and, uh, this is this is wonderful that, that they put this on and, and get to, to bring all of you together. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect that they have like some sort of an alumni association where people from the past ones stay in touch. And yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, Great. yeah, Paul mentioned that uh, at some of the science conferences that if there's a large gathering of alumni from different Eco Days, that they'll pull them together and interact, and so it's not just. Mm -hmm. You know, single generations, but cross generations of expertise. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great because yeah, that just keeps enlarging your potential pool of collaborators and mm -hmm. people you can call on for advice and, and input and, and to bring some some other aspect uh, to shine light yeah. on, on your project. Absolutely, yeah. Wonderful. That's 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 great. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about the need for more sort of resilience in our ecosystems and you know, our sort of human ecosystem as we're facing increasing changes. Does either of your work really sort of, how, how does it contribute to that? Does it help us understand the world better that's going to that's gonna enable better human resilience? Uh, enable a better human resilience? Right. Uh, I think that it's important to understand what these microorganisms are doing in our environment because we'll be able to uh, better predict uh, how an ecosystem might change under certain environmental conditions. So I think that that, that uh, ties in a lot to how we can be more resilient in this in the, in the current climate, for sure. 
Sure, I mean, we, we got, we got to know what's going to happen if you can't predict sort of what your microbes are going to do. You're not going to know much yes. about what the rest of the world is going to do, right? Yeah. The microbes really run the whole show in some sense. Yeah. When, when, when all the algae in the ocean die, we're, we're in big trouble, right? Mm -hmm. our, our oxygen levels go screaming down. And <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's that's wonderful stuff. Uh, so, so where where do you envision taking taking your research there? Are you going to what do you want to do with it over the next five years? How do you want to develop it? Uh, yeah, so i am actually made an interesting move I, from uh, during my PhD work at USC. I was My specialty was in time series stations, which means that we visit the same location every single month on a very regular basis. And I was involved in two time series stations, one that was had been running for over 15 years off the coast of California. It's called the San Pedro Ocean Time Series Station. And then the other one is... 100 kilometers north of, of here in Honolulu, where uh, they've been sampling for just over 30 years now, uh, the station Aloha. And uh, by studying the how the microbial communities operate, who's there, what they're doing each month, we get an idea of, of uh, what's going on in the baseline of the community. And then uh, over time, uh, we can understand seasonal changes in the microbial community and what that means. Uh, I did a diyule study where I actually looked at microorganisms every four hours to see how uh, their activity changed over the course of a single day. Uh, That's right, so microbes migrate up and down in the water column a bit, don't they? Yeah, so, but there's all, they're very intimately tied to the rising and setting of the sun mm -hmm. in some cases. Uh, and now, um, so I, that was my PhD work, and now where I'm taking my research now is at Woods Hole, where I'm actually going to be studying uh, uh, the... Um, Microbial eukaryotes associated with hydrothermal vent systems. And so that venting fluid coming out of hydrothermal vents, which uh, from the sea floor, uh, that's uh, uh, often uh, highly enriched, really warm venting fluid. It's mixing with that seawater and it's creating this little uh, unique environment. Uh, and there's a lot of activity going on there that I want to understand. Right, those are very, very odd environments because the, their main energy source is not the sun. It's, exactly. It's actually heat from within the planet. That's, yes. So they were not really well known. Well, they're still very well known, right? Yes. But you're helping to explore that. And how about you, Bryce? Where, where, where are you going to take your work? Um, I think in the broadest sense is that um, satellites right now, they're a really powerful tool, but there's still a lot of uncertainty attached to what you're seeing. Um, and and NASA uh, has plans, and some of the other space agencies have plans to develop more uh, sophisticated sensors that can give us a, a better picture of what's happening. And so I always like to say that it's um, getting closer to, you know, from what we can see in space now is getting closer to what we can see in the water now, which is an immensely different amount of detail. And so uh, what I'm focusing on is, is what are the tools that we can use to take that data and get some, some really fine, uh, detailed products that might tie into, say, like Sarah's work um, better because they're on such different levels of information that you're gleaning. And so if we can really start to meet in the middle, I think we can get a more complete picture of these ecosystems. Excellent. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like a great sort of outcome of EcoDage, right? Bringing people with these very, who are looking at even sort of the same issue but from, from very different heights, as it were, uh, and, and get them to look at it together. And, and so your uh, knowledge can sort of feed one another very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. right. Excellent, excellent. And so you both are, are relatively young, relatively recently out, out of the school. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for aspiring scientists, maybe people just starting out in college or in community colleges, uh, to, to help them along? I would, I would say uh, find role models. I think role models can be a great way to uh, find your passion in a way. Uh, see someone who you look up to or uh, you uh, feel like your interests align and uh, that's someone that you can ask advice of and um, that's someone who can also serve as a, a mentor perhaps that can lead you to where new opportunities might be so you can pursue your passion. Excellent. Uh, my advice is going to be follow your passions. Uh -huh. I think. If, if you're not finding satisfaction with where your science is at now by doing that, I think it'll be a stepping stone to where you want to be in the future. Yeah, it, it, it is very interesting that, that the passion that people feel for their work really translates into their success often, right? I mean, the, the scientists who are often most successful are just 
deeply, deeply care about their work. They, they care about it. it, sort of becomes almost uh, life enveloping for them in some cases, right? In some cases, almost a little too far, but uh, it, it is a really critical aspect uh, to, to get uh, get that moving, get that, that, that caring really comes across, too. And I, I think it's important, too, in, in this, uh, that, that you see people in this, in this, from this symposium, presumably, who care about different but related things. And again, you can probably feed off of one another's passion there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, excellent. So, um, I, tell, I tell you what, before we, before we, we uh, go on here, I want, I want to break, because I heard recently a, a cute little uh, science joke that struck me as very appropriate for Eco Days, and I thought, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd drop it on you here. Yeah. All right. So, two fish swim into a bar, and the first fish says, I'll have some H2O. The second fish says, I'll have some H2O too. The second fish dies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's a stupid little science joke, but you know. <laughs> So, anyhow, uh, we are, I guess, wrapping things all up, if I understand it, and we are about out of time. Uh, Grace and uh, Sarah, I very much appreciate you guys being here, taking time out of this symposium to talk to me, and it's been great talking to you. I, I wish you both uh, the, the best with your work, and uh, look forward to it, and, and hope the rest of the conference goes well. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you'll come back and uh, join us for another episode of Life of Science.